virtual audience, friends, however you found or stumbled upon this content, we appreciate you. Whether on LinkedIn or YouTube, thank you for joining us for the Happy Half Hour, a show in a time of corona based on the three main reasons I went to trade shows, to meet cool people, discover new brands, and extract insights that can help drive strategy in the industry. On today's episode, we have a 20-year toy and art industry veteran, an entrepreneur passionate about mentoring and giving back, a designer, an inventor, a marketeer, and for sure, a professional networker. She is the COO at one of the fastest growing doll companies, Healthy Roots Dolls, a partner with Black Creatives Global Networking for Multicultural Talent, and most recently named as the chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee, Committee for WIT, aka hashtag WIT. Delany West, welcome to the show. Hey, Steve. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. It's nice to meet you. Likewise. I feel like I know you. Whenever I see you, you always have mad energy. I appreciate you. Delany, can That's I it. ask you to give us the story behind Healthy Roots Dolls and sharing any so, recent success stories for the brand? Absolutely, Steve. I am so proud to serve as a CEO for, for, COO for Healthy Roots. Healthy Roots has a phenomenal founder, young founder, Yalitza Jean Charles. She founded the company that creates dogs that empower young girls. Um, and they represent the beauty of our diversity. 65% of the world's population has curly hair. Um, oh, me too. During my career. So 65% of the world's population has curly or wavy hair, okay. I'm, I'm an example today. During my career, I've worked with many brands. I've worked to develop many brands, but this Healthy Roots quite possibly is the project that's most meaningful to me. Um, on the website, we cite on our website, Dove conducted a study in 2016, found that only four out of 10 girls love their curls, right? Um, these, are, these are young girls. So our work in this industry, we have a response you know, toys impact how we think, how we act, and how we perceive ourselves. So when girls can't find dolls that look like them, it negatively, negatively impacts their self-esteem, right? Um, and that's why Zoe was created, the first Healthy Roots doll. Uh, you know, we go beyond just painting a doll brown. Uh, Yelitsa created an educational play experience with curl care, right? And it's for the child. It's for the mom, dad, it's for the entire family. And I even continue to learn um, as I'm working on the project on how to care for my own hair. So true Boy. educational experience, play, um, and, and full educational experience in, in this, in this uh, company and product. That's incredible. Um, look, there's a lot going on and in and, and a huge positive movement where people are supporting uh, businesses that are owned by people of color and black, uh, especially black female entrepreneurs are, are being gravitated towards new and healthy roots dolls is one of those examples. You guys just recently had a really successful Kickstarter, correct? Right. And I'll just say one thing. I, you know, I, I leverage my social networks just like you do. And that's how I met the founder. Um, and I was so compelled by her story. Um, this was her thesis project. Um, really? uh, she's a RISD student. I had followed her career, and so when she had the opportunity to bring in someone to help her build and grow her brand, she reached out to me, and I was absolutely thrilled. Um, she has been, Healthy Roots Dolls and Yulita has been consistent in her messaging to girls about self-love. Um, she didn't need to pivot. She didn't need to, to, to revise any of her messaging to reposition for what's been happening in society. Um, because there's been some, like, to your point, there's been lots of discovery and celebration of um, Black and female-owned brands. But Yulitsa and Healthy Roots has been consistent yeah. um, in the goals of this company to teach girls and loving their curls. And so she was just well-positioned, done the work, and she was ready. She, 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 she's, been, she's been doing the work. Amazing. Amazing. Well, you're also involved with another amazing organization in the toy industry, WIT, or Women in Toys. For any of our listeners that might not be familiar with the organization, can you share what the organization's all about and how you're involved? Right. And we go by WIT. It's shortened uh, for women in toys, but it's also women in toys 
licensing and entertainment. It's a nonprofit organization. The global community of 2000 women and men. So Steve, there's room for you. Um, our mission is to advance women in these industries. And I also serve as Ohio co-chair. I joined after meeting representatives um, at the Javits Center at Toy Fair one year. This had to have been maybe six years ago. Um, there wasn't a space for me to have conversations about my profession and what's a male dominated uh, business industry. And it's really important that we have a network to connect with outside of our primary places of work. Um, and I really value the women in the conversations I'm able to have within WIT. That's awesome. That's awesome. And, and a perfect segue to a, a congratulation of uh, congratulations of sort on your appointment to the chair of the diversity and inclusions committee. Can you tell us some about some about some of your goals and what impact you want to leave on wit and the toy industry in general? Steve, thank you so much. I'm I'm really proud to have been invited to take on the task, and I'm excited about the work uh, at wit. We believe that DNI can't be a one-off initiative. Um, it's a constant work and prop. Pro, uh, progress and it needs to be maintained and nurtured to be effective. And so our goal at WIT is to engage um, in outreach efforts to the uh, industries that we serve in order to raise awareness, provide educational programming, um, grant scholarships mm. to students at a variety of colleges and universities and participate in job fairs across the country. Um, I would hope that we all agree that brands should reflect their consumers and companies in our industry can do this by hiring people that look like their consumers, right? And it starts with diverse teams. Um, and comp we know that companies and brands benefit from decision-making that comes out of diverse teams and diverse leadership. Yeah, I agree, I agree. Mm -hmm. I, I'm fascinated with this moment of when somebody enters the toy industry because it is when they do, they often have the best ideas. So I'm like, you know, I'm focused on finding people that are curious, but I'm even more focused about actually getting somebody into the toy industry because it's, you know, it's, it's a great business. It's, it it's not easy, but it's creative and ever changing and, and social and such a, like I'm, I feel like I'm doing an, an infomercial for the tea, for the toy business, but it's good. And, and I think a lot of people of color maybe don't even know that it exists. So like to me, as long, we just need to make all sorts of noise on all sorts of channels to know, to let people who have just graduated or are in college or in middle school, like that this is a cool career. And Steve, you're so right. You do a great job at highlighting our industry. And when I entered into the industry, there was, I didn't know about it. I kind of stumbled. And so anytime anyone asks me to come and speak to students or school, I'm more than glad to do so because I know these kids have no idea that this is actually a career and there's a path to get there. Absolutely. Well, you're also, I want to I wanna kind of dig deeper into your resume a little bit. You're also a partner in a company called Black Creative, a creative networking group for black and people of color in media, advertising, technology, and fashion. Can you give us some more context on, the, on your work with this group and how can people watching the show get involved? Okay, I'm absolutely proud to, to be a part of the group. After seven plus years serving on the advisory board, I was named partner and chief uh, strategy officer this year um, at Black Creatives. I joined the organization's leadership team with the goal to shape the direction and plan for the next decade of growth. Um, you can find us where we are most robust is on LinkedIn. There are various networks um, where if you're looking for creative consult on a project, if you're looking for diverse creative direction, um, we're there to help. If you're looking to engage with us in terms of looking for talent, you can find us. And so reach out to us on LinkedIn. There are a couple of channels where you can find us. We are on Facebook, but the best place is LinkedIn. Um, we're also on Twitter at Black Creatives and also um, Instagram. And so I stepped into this role into COVID and a month before the George Floyd protest. Mm -hmm. And I was in the eye of like two storms. Um, 
But because of my experience in leading teams, I was prepared to center and steady this organization during what has been one of the most tumultuous times for our network networks. And I want to say, we've been counsel to many executives and brands um, throughout this period, but we've been in existence through 2000 and, you know, since 2007. Uh, and we operate from this base of community, right? We, we are not a network that has been hastily sewn together uh, yeah. uh, or quickly curated. You know, you see these lists in response to this, this crisis. We've been here. And so we were prepared to pivot on a dime um, and continue to be a resource for our clients and our partners. Uh, we were positioned to help and offer leadership lessons to our executives and associates. And so you can reach out and engage with us um, if you need cultural sensitivity uh, as it relates to your creative process, we're here to, uh, projects, we're here to help. Or if you need a little bit of guidance for looking to, to bring uh, creatives of color into your company, you can reach out to us. Amazing, amazing. I really dig that. Um, you know, I, I, it's pretty obvious that you are, I want to call you a professional networker of sort. Uh, what is your philosophy and approach to building your network and maybe more importantly, sustaining it? Okay. Sustaining is so important. You know, I started engaging um, for uh, ethnographic research and consumer insight, right? I want to know how people um, engage with the products and the brands that I was working on. But I really started to leverage social when I figured out there's only so much time to cover a, a trade show, right? You're setting right. up the show, you're working the floor, um, you're meeting customers, you're walking the show, and then you're entertaining business partners after the show. Like, when do you get to meet the new people? Like, where do you get to meet the new people? So I started boosting my signal via social and following hashtag connecting via, you know, via virtual meetups. Um, sometimes my only experience at a show is hashtag following because I'm busy selling and Art. engaging in the booth, right? And so that's when I really started to leverage the social part of a show experience. And sometimes, Steve, I do it and I'm not even at the show because I couldn't travel to it, but I'm, I'm following on social. So yep. the key for me in sustaining is giving as much as you take, right? Mm. Also share, and you do this well, sharing, sharing relevant, honest insight and content and engaging so that you're moving against group th think um, and you've got to do a bit of challenging and you got to give honest perspective and you got to be vulnerable, right? Because if you're going to be honest, you, gotta, you can't just say what people want to hear. Um, important, checking in authentically, um, sending notes of hello, like little, and, you know, and DMs. And don't request anything. Like, how about send the message and not ask somebody for something? You know, just check on them. Um, and so my favorite thing to do as of late is actually picking up the phone. You know, we're on Zooms, we're sending DMs, we're posting, but I'm trying to, to, to go for non-digital connections and picking up the phone to talk to people and people respond well to that. That's how I've been continuing to cultivate the people that are, that are in my network. And that's how I check in on the new people that, you know, I've just um, joined, you know, uh, invited to my network. The check-in is, is vital. You have to yep. be proactive. You have yep. to. Uh, what do you do when your post bombs? Like, what, what, how do you deal with, with making a mistake when it comes to networking? Oh, God. I'm... <laughs> I'm so careful about it. Like I overthink everything. I don't know that I've had. So if you, so a bomb post might be saying the wrong thing. And I'm very rarely do I do that because I'm always making sure that I'm pitching, saying that I have the right pitch. I don't want to offend. I'm very sensitive. So I overthink everything. Um, so I don't, I think that I, I get it wrong. Now maybe a pitch, maybe, maybe a post didn't connect with someone. You know, I leave it up. But yeah. never, never do I say something that rubs someone the wrong way. I, at least I hope I don't. If I did, I, I haven't heard about it yet. <laughs> I've only deleted like one post. I right as COVID was starting and the, the toilet paper craze was just through the roof. There was this company that we, we represent called Tomi and they had this paper mache new innovation out of Japan, but it used toilet paper instead of paper. 
And I just put this thing out there and I was like, perfect timing. <laughs> and, I, and I post the sizzle and then somebody just gives me, you know, gives me some <laughs> lip and bad. And I'm like, delete. I'm scared. I still like the item. <laughs> you know, at least we have the ability to self edit. I mean, that's a good thing to self edit. Like that's good. Yeah. Well, as I was preparing for this interview and read some of your LinkedIn recommendations, Two, two of them stood out to me, one from Tony Carey and Corey Jackson, both pertaining to your work on, as creative director for Black Girls Run. Can you tell us about that experience and what did you do to gain your colleagues' respect and admiration? My God, Tony Carey and uh, Corey Jackson, like they're on my two favorite, like my favorite people in the world is they might be like one and two. Um, I don't know, are you a runner? Uh, no, no, okay. no. But, I bike, you know, me, I'm into this thing called Mace Flow. Like if you can do one thing, look up Mace Flow. Uh, it's this new workout deal and it is incredible. And I'm stronger than I've maybe been in, in a while and more limber. Anyway, please continue. Okay. I'm going to check it out. Um, but I'm going to just tell you in the run, the running community, you know, we are a bunch of weirdo freaks because you know what? We get hooked on 5k. It's mm -hmm. the gateway drug. And we go to the opposite end of the spectrum really fast. We do Ragnars and Ironmans and mm. seven continent marathons, right? Mm. And so, you know, I say <laughs> runners do this because we're passionate and we're visionary and we're dedicated to a always accomplishing a goal, right? Mm -hmm. So Tony and Corey, um, uniquely phenomenal women who I was fortunate to spend time with this period of BGR brand building, um, we all enjoyed this journey of run, um, but we also enjoyed leading other women to the sport as we were building this incredible um, community. And I think we knew that what we were doing was greater, greater than our own contributions, you know, to the sport. Um, and I contributed in three capacities. I volunteered as a run ambassador in New Jersey. Um, I served the executive board on brand strategy. And then the piece that you, you saw on LinkedIn, I was a consultant for brand development and design. But we, I think, tend to love projects that we're most passionate about, right? You would, you would say that that is true. Absolutely. Um, I think those women are able to share those kinds of reviews about me because it was recognized that I 100% I believed in the Black Girls Run mission. Um, I was passionate, you know, we all were. And it was evidenced by our shared dedication uh, and excellent, excellent in, in the work um, that we're doing and to each other as team members. And so, you know, it, it was based in um, goal setting and, and yeah. achievement because you know, that's what running's about. I like it. I like it. Well, I have a new challenge for you now that I know that you are a runner. Uh, I think the toy industry needs to do a 5K. And mm -hmm. I went as far as working with my ex-colleague, Barbara, on renting the Katy Trail uh, in, in Dallas uh, during the fall toy preview show. Because I think the toy industry needs a little bit more work-life balance and more you know, fit activities. And you know, a lot of our networking events, and, and I throw some and have you know, are mostly parties, I mean, which is great. But I think there's some other opportunities that we can open up to not only network, but also open up to outside media and influencers and bloggers that, that could participate and, and a charity aspect of it. Like, you know, if we did a 5K in New York before New York Toy Fair, and that's how the, the show opened, you know, with everybody there, that could be cool. Anyway, just a cloud thought. That, that that's an amazing idea. When you want to plan that, please pull me in. I'm on it. You know, we could do something virtually today and we can do something in real life when outside opens back up. I'm in. Okay. I dig it. I dig it. Well, I have the best news for you because you have made it to the very end of the show. We like to call it the creation of positive energy. The creation of positive energy where you get to shout out anyone anywhere in the world for doing a great job appreciation and acknowledgement goes a long long way the floor is yours 
You know, this was so tough. I thought about it and there wasn't just one person and there's just an important group of people that I want to shout out. Um, I want to shout out the many people who have been displaced from their jobs and careers and places of work because of the pandemic, because there's a lot out there, right? Um, and I want to say the way that these people, because I know a lot of them have been moving forward, have been, in, it's been inspiring to me. Um, I want to, them to continue to stay encouraged. Um, and please reach out to me if I can be a resource to connect you with someone in my network or boost your signal. And I want to ask anyone that is watching this segment to consider doing the same because there's so many smart, talented people who are displaced. Um, and we can be stronger together by leveraging our networks. Um, and I want to thank you, Steve, for being a phenomenal boost of energy whenever I see you because uh, on social, because I'm always energized and intrigued by what you're saying and sharing. You featured one of my mentors, Richard Durr. Um, he's yeah. someone that I look up to for thought leadership. I mean, he's doing an incredible job in our industry. And um, that's what made me reach out to you. So thank you for that. My man, Rick Durr. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Delany West, you were incredible. I really appreciate your insights, your motivation, your networking skills. This is the part of the show where we put our hands up against the camera and say, bye. Bye. Thank you very much.